Hello and welcome to another historical tour in Microsoft Flight Simulator. This time we find ourselves just outside of Clovis, New Mexico at Cannon Air Force Base. Cannon is about 15 miles away from the border of the Texas Panhandle with Amarillo to our northeast and Tucumcari to the north. Today we'll be taking our F-4 Phantom to explore Roswell, New Mexico, and features of the White Sands Missile Range near Alamogordo, New Mexico, including the Trinity Monument, the site of the world's first nuclear detonation. On the ground here at Cannon, headed through the parking lot out to where I parked the plane last night when I got in, it's 107 degrees out here. Uh, which is just nasty. So the faster I can get the air conditioning fired up and get out of this heat, the better. I do not enjoy hot weather. Our Phantom today is an F4J painted in the markings of VF-143, the Puke and Dogs, circa 1972, maybe 1971. The J model was the Navy's uh, Vietnam late war variant. Between the F-4B, which is what the Navy used at the beginning of the Vietnam conflict, and the F-4S, which was a post-war upgrade with better engines and better avionics. The F-4 began life as the F-4H-1, making its first flight in 1958 and in 1962 was redesignated under the new Tri-Service Designation System as the F-4 Phantom II. The original Navy Phantom was the McDonnell FH-1, operational in 1947, and the Navy's first jet fighter. The F-4J made its first flight in 1966, featuring improved engines, radars, landing gear, fuel capacity, 00 ejection seats, and improved ground attack capability. 522 of the aircraft were built. The type began deliveries to squadrons in October of that year, and the first Marine J models arrived in June of 1967. This particular plane is historically significant as it's marked as belonging to Commander Harley Hall, commanding officer of VF-143. Hall had previously been the leader of the Blue Angels during the 1970 and 71 seasons. Only one day before the Paris Peace Accords ceasefire took place, Hall and his Rio, Lieutenant Commander P.A. Keinsler, were shot down by AAA over Quang Tri, making them the last Navy combat loss of the war. Hall was also the last Navy pilot to be listed as MIA. Keinsler was captured and returned within a few months. Though Hall's status was updated to POW, at some point he was seemingly killed in captivity, and his status was updated again in 1980 to deceased. We see that the Rio indicated here is Gary Hughes, not Keinsler, so it may be that this was Hall's plane from a different deployment, possibly from the squadron's 1971 deployment, or maybe it was just a different airplane from early in the 72 deployment. Hall was shot down in F-4J serial number 155768, while this aircraft serial number is 155887. This particular plane actually survived the war, transferring to VF-121 pacemakers in the mid-1970s. In the early 80s, it was upgraded to an F-4S and ended up with the Marines in VMAF-212 Lancers. 155887 was retired in June of 1986 and stored at Cherry Point, North Carolina. I can't tell from the map where storage areas might be or might have been at Cherry Point, and the plane hasn't been seen since 1996, so I assume that at this point, it's long been scrapped. Cursory walk around is complete. Let's climb up now into the cockpit. And here we are. We'll take a quick look around and then we're going to start prepping the plane for engine start. It 
Switches in the back right here are in-game, a couple of in-game switches. Crew visibility will be on and chocks and engine covers off now that we're in the cockpit. And then our ladder retract switch is over here too. You can see it coming up and securing. I believe that would actually be a ground crew thing from the outside. I don't, don't think it was, uh, I don't think that's an actual switch, but there is our battery on and I'll adjust my lights. Both internal and external. All right, personnel are clear of the engines, so let's get the right side. Number two engine started first. We're looking for 10% uh, RPM to engage our igniter. Our ignition switch. There's 10%. Next milestone will be at 50% and then I'll turn on the generator. There's 50, generator two is on. You can see oil pressure coming up on the right side, as well as the, uh, the right side hydraulic pressure is now coming up. Hydraulic pressure one and the utility pressure is still off, as well as pneumatic air down low. And in fact, I've noticed that in this particular plane, the utility and the pneumatic don't actually move. So we'll just be looking uh, at hydraulic pressure one and two actually giving a reading. I believe that utility and pneumatics are simply not modeled because all of the control surfaces and systems that they actually power work fine. So uh, I think it's just a matter of not being modeled. And again, looking for 50% on the RPM gauge, and then we will engage generator one. Generator and bus lights are now out, so we're getting our electrical power. And again, we can see oil pressure has now come up. Hydraulic pressure is looking good as well. Control surface is good. Ignition switches are off set our takeoff trim. Landing gear lever, uh, verify that is down. That must have been knocked up when I was getting into the cockpit here. Set transponder, pitot heat on, AC to auto. Set our radios to on and uh, the frequencies that we want. And with that, we are ready for taxi. Cannon Air Force Base was originally established in the 1920s as Port Air Field, a civilian airstrip servicing Clovis and the surrounding region. In 1929, Clovis became a stop on the first coast-to-coast air-slash-rail system between Los Angeles and New York City. Ford Tri-Motors would fly passengers and mail from Los Angeles to Clovis, making stops at Kingman and Winslow, Arizona. From Clovis, passengers transferred to the Santa Fe Railroad, boarding an overnight train to Waynoka, Oklahoma, where they would pick up another tri-motor to Columbus, Ohio. 
There, the final leg of the journey was on the Pennsylvania Railroad into New York City. The network was designed by Transcontinental Air Transport, or TAT, with the help of Charles Lindbergh, and meant that a passenger could travel from coast to coast in only 48 hours, at that time a feat of modern transportation technology. TAT would later merge to become TWA, Trans World Airlines. TAT offered in-flight meals on the Trimotors, one of the first companies to do so, and used rudimentary navigation aids in the form of large lighted arrows along the route to guide pilots in bad weather or low light conditions. DC-3s from various airlines would continue using Clovis Field through the 1950s, until 1959, when the Clovis Municipal Airport was opened on the other side of town. Port Air Field was taken over by the military during World War II, becoming Clovis Army Airfield, and was a training center for B-24 Liberators. Post-war, the base was slated to become a training field for Strategic Air Command, but the Korean War changed the Air Force's plans, and Clovis became a Tactical Fighter Command instead. F-51 Mustangs of the Air National Guard rotated to Japan and South Korea during the Korean War. In the late 50s, the base hosted F-100D Super Sabres, and from the 70s until the 90s was the sole base of all three F-111 Aardvark squadrons. Today, the base is under the Air Force Special Operations Command, hosting specialty aircraft like CV-22 Ospreys, MQ-9 Reaper drones, and AC-130 gunships. All right, let's go ahead and review our takeoff brief before we get down to the end of the runway here. With two wing tanks, four sidewinders, and four sparrows, our aircraft's drag index is 21.6, which means our optimal cruise speed is Mach 0.88. At takeoff weight, our optimal altitude will be around 40,000 feet, but we're not gonna get anywhere near that high on, on this trip, so not too worried about that. Our top speed and maneuvering are limited by our wing tanks, uh, not really the missiles at all, just the tanks. But right now, they're just for show, and they're empty because we don't have any fuel in them. Full tanks are heavy and much more restrictive. So with the empty tanks, that gives us, uh, we can get up to a max speed of 750 knots, or Mach 1.6, with a maximum G load of plus 6, minus 2. On takeoff itself, we'll do a full afterburner takeoff to impress everybody on the ground, of course, and then accelerate at full military power to 350 knots. At 350, I start pitching to maintain that speed, and then we hold that climb until we intercept cruise speed, which, like I said in our case, Mach 0.88. I've noticed this seems to be pretty standard procedure for most Vietnam-era jets for any of the services. If you've watched my Strike Fighters F-105 series, then you know that this procedure is basically identical to that one. And the F-100 is also the same, except that I think the climb speed was 300 instead of 350. But otherwise, identical. I imagine that modern jets probably still have similar procedures and speeds, but honestly, I'm just not familiar enough with new stuff to be able to confirm that one way or the other. But that's what I would assume, because that sort of makes sense. about time to get the lids closed as we're coming down to the end of the runway. Canopy lever closed. They're down and secured. We've still got traffic in the pattern, so we'll come to a stop at the hold short. We'll do one final scan of the cockpit and verify we're ready to go. And once we're cleared, we'll move out onto the runway. Alright, he 
he's still coming around. Traffic is on base. Looks like an F-22. All right, one final check. We'll go uh, clockwise around the cockpit. Flaps are set. Ignition is off. Starters are off. Trim is set. Anti-skid is on. Landing gear is confirmed down. Generators are on. Transponder is set to altitude. Pedo is on. Air conditioning is on. Landing lights are on, taxi off, all other externals are on, field bypass switch for the tail hook is on, and with that we are ready to go. We're clear left, clear right. We have permission to move out onto the runway. So here we go, position and hold. Again, this is gonna be a full afterburner Take off, we're going to be looking to rotate at 160 knots. Pulling up and then uh, I'll kill the cans, but then continue accelerating on mill power up to 350. And then we'll continue the climb. And there's the F-22 clearing the runway now. We're clear for takeoff, runway zero 04. Here we go. There's 100 knots. There's 150, just at 160. are up we're off the afterburners now just on full mill power just above 350 so pitching up to uh, bring that speed down and we'll maintain that up through the climb down there that's clovis itself a city of about 40,000 people the city was created in 1906 when the Santa Fe Railroad bought a large level section of land in order to build maintenance facilities on. They built a station and a large yard with a full roundhouse and turntable, and that same yard is still there today, now under the BNSF uh, label. In fact, the turntable is still there and there's the remnants of the roundhouse, um, although at this point it's just a concrete foundation. The town was originally called Riley Switch, though by the time it was incorporated as a town in 1909, it had been renamed Clovis in honor of the first Catholic King of the Franks. Supposedly, the story goes that the station master's daughter was reading history at the time and was reading about Clovis and was extremely interested in him, so the station master was able to get the town named after him.
over the top of Cannon Air Force Base. Now we get a nice good look at it from the air. And we'll just cross right back over the top of that and then we will be on our nav course headed down to Roswell, New Mexico. We're on our way to Roswell now, about 80 miles to the southwest. And of course, we all know what Roswell is so famous for. That's right, it was where pioneering physicist Dr. Robert Goddard moved to continue his rocket test flights in the 1930s. Goddard was one of the founding fathers of modern rocketry and helped pave the way for the space age with his inventions of the first liquid-fueled rocket, the multi-stage rocket, and the use of gyroscopes and steerable thrust to control rocket flight. Goddard was a New England man, such as myself, being born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1882. In 1912, he had his doctorate and was teaching and researching physics at Princeton University. He nearly died of tuberculosis in 1913, after which he moved back to Worcester, where he began to actively test his theories on rocket flight. At the time, rockets were not considered real science or suitable research for a respectable physicist. Goddard's theories of space flight were often ridiculed by the press and his peers, leading him to become very private and protective of his work. When Goddard secured a $5,000 grant from the Smithsonian Institution, other scientists were shocked that such a large grant would be given to research as useless as rocketry. However, Goddard persevered. When World War I broke out, he offered his rocket experience to the U.S. military. The Army accepted his proposal, and Goddard invented the idea of a tube-based rocket launcher as an infantry weapon. He successfully demonstrated the first bazooka at the Aberdeen Proving Ground only five days before the armistice was signed. With the end of the war, the idea wouldn't be further developed or adopted by the Army until the outbreak of World War II. In the winter of 1926, Goddard began his first test flights after spending years developing a liquid-fueled engine. At his aunt's farm in Auburn, Mass., Goddard's first rocket rose 41 feet in 2.5 seconds, coming down in a nearby cabbage field. Additional test flights continued over the next three years, though each one brought more notoriety to Goddard, and it was becoming more difficult to conduct his experiments. He needed a remote location away from population areas with year-round good weather to test his increasingly larger and more powerful rockets. In 1930, Charles Lindbergh stepped in, forming a friendship with Goddard and arranging a deal with the famously rich Guggenheim family to fund Goddard's research with a $100,000 grant. It was in 1930 that Goddard, his wife, and his team moved to Roswell, New Mexico, settling in a home on the outskirts of town. He remained there for most of 12 years, almost until his death. He and his wife connected deeply with the community in Roswell, becoming members of the local Rotary Club, the Women's Club, and the Episcopal Church. Goddard could work there in isolation and secrecy and not endanger anyone with his experiments. The locals, on their part, valued his personal privacy, and bothersome travelers or newspaper men who asked for Goddard's home would be misdirected. The moderate climate was good for testing, but also good for Goddard's health, as he was always battling the remnants of TB. He and his team made 56 test flights over 12 years, 17 of which reached altitudes over 1,000 feet. He left Roswell in 1942 to work on jet-assisted takeoff mechanisms for the Navy in Annapolis, Maryland. The humid climate there accelerated his decline in health, and he died in 1945 from throat cancer. As per the manual, uh, normal descent in the F-4J is 250 knots, throttles at idle, no air brakes. And to drop from 25,000 feet would be about 40 miles. It depends on your drag index. So again, we're around 20, so it would still be 40 miles. I tend to go faster. I keep the speed up, and I usually do about 350 in the descent. And that usually gets me around 4,000 feet per minute. So 
now let's get our fuel situation squared away because if you look at our main fuel gauge here, you can see that we're down a thousand pounds to nine thousand. That's only registering the internals, so what we or our center internals, I should say. So down here we have a fuel selector switch. It's a uh, four position switch. It's got it goes from off to outboard. That would be if we wanted to cycle fuel from the outer wing tanks. The center position, which would be a center line tank, and then interior wing, and that's what we're going to select it on. So the fuel that's in the wings is now being pumped from there into the central tanks, and this fuel gauge will actually fill back up to 10,000 pounds, where it will stay until the internal wing tanks are empty. So those will drain first, keeping the center tanks filled, and then when, uh, when that gauge starts to move again, we'll turn the switch to off, because there's no more fuel. Our outboard wing tanks, like I said, although they are installed, or they are attached, they're just for show uh, because they're empty right now. If this was a real museum plane in real life and I was flying it around, I would bring the tanks with me in case I wanted to fill them up for the longer trips to and from. But of course, once you're away from home base, you wouldn't be able to drop the tank somewhere. And of course, you wouldn't want to be dumping the tanks over the countryside. You'd be keeping them on, so they would just be empty. And that's sort of what we're simulating here. Banking over the river towards the north end of the city which is starting to come into more clear view up ahead. Some of the outlying farms out to the left there. And our first stop is going to be on the northeast side of the city, and that is the home of Dr. Robert Goddard. Just over the North End communities now, that's Main Street going right down the center of the town, down towards the airfield at the south end, so over here, up here somewhere, just off to the left, I'm, I'm looking for it, it's gonna be the little ranch house I'm looking for. Where is it? I know it from the map, but I haven't identified it yet in the game. Did I go too far? Nope, there it is. Okay, I just ID'd it. So it's uh, it's on the it's on the north side of that half round field there. There's a square field, and then there's a little house next to it, and that's going to be the Goddard house. Robert and Esther Goddard's home was a small ranch house on the northeast edge of town at 1501 East Mescalero Road. The house is a one-story, flat-roofed adobe building covered in stucco. Built in 1908, the Goddards lived in it from 1930 to 1942, and it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1988. Behind the house is a shed that was the location of Goddard's workshop which has since been reconstructed in the Roswell Museum downtown. Today, the house is in private hands and appears to be a small ranch. And of course, we can't have come all this way to not give the father of Rocketry's house a few low-level fast passes. It is just to the left of the nose. We'll go up on one wing over the top of it, give you a nice good view right over the top of the house. Back on the power as we'll pull up and away. Downtown Roswell to the right. 
more to see down there. We'll be uh, we'll be back over there in a few minutes here. All right, that was a pretty mild pass on the first one. Let's uh, let's go for it a little harder. At idle as we approach, we'll come down close, then we'll light the cans for a big boom over the top. Like I said, the uh, the property is not a museum or anything. It's on the Register of Historic Places, but it's privately owned. So these poor owners probably don't know what the hell is going on right now. We're just harassing them for no reason. But if you're going to own a house that was lived in by the Goddards, this is the kind of attention you can expect to get. <laughs> Oops, I came down in the wrong spot. I was looking at the wrong green spot. We've already, uh, actually already passed the house. It's behind us. It's back there. So we'll just set up for our final uh, high-speed pass. We'll just go to the north instead of the south here. Everything is very flat and grid-like, and it become becomes very easy to... Uh, lose your reference points if you're not paying enough attention. There it is. So right there in front of the nose. We're at about 350 knots. We'll go full power up over the top of the house. Give them a little show with a high G pull out. Vapor coming off the wings. Pulling about four, about five, up to six G. Six is our limit as we're up over the top of the town. Full afterburner still, pull rolling out. And back off the power as we're up over Main Street, downtown Roswell. The ex-Army airfield just in front of us. As we say goodbye to the Goddards, we're now gonna focus downtown. We're now going to look for the Roswell Museum and we'll give them a few passes next. The museum is right on Main Street up towards the north here, so we're just going to keep an eye out. I'm going to try to lock in on it and find it. Just west of the small train yard and along the bank of the Spring River is the Roswell Museum and Art Center. It was originally founded in 1936 and features exhibits about the art and history of the American Southwest. It includes art and artifacts from the Wild West, local Native American culture, and Spanish colonization. In 1949, Esther Goddard began gifting her husband's research and equipment to the museum. And in 1959, the museum opened a dedicated Goddard wing, which includes a recreation of his workshop. His original launch tower stands outside the museum with a bronze statue of Goddard himself, recreated from a famous photo of him during a test. In 1968, a planetarium was built that is also dedicated to him, and in 1972, a moon rock was donated by astronaut Harrison Schmidt in honor of Goddard's contribution to rocketry. In his downtime, Goddard enjoyed painting the New Mexico landscapes, sometimes with artist Peter Hurd, whose art is featured in the Roswell Museum.
All right, final pass. We'll do a fast high G pull. Just like we did at the Goddard house this time. We'll come in. Uh, we're over the fields of east of town. There's the little river. One of the little rivers. Yeah, there it is. So we'll, we're following the river in, heading east to west, coming back into town, right towards downtown. And up over the top, and there's the pole. That's where we're up and away. Hopefully not doing too much damage to the museum or the surrounding neighborhoods. And off to our left, we're up over the top of the remains of the Roswell Municipal Airport. This airport began life sometime in the late 1920s as a 3,100-foot circular sod field with a singular steel hangar. During World War II, it was taken over by the military and became Auxiliary Airfield No. 9 for the Roswell Army Airfield south of town. At some point during the war, the Army replaced the airport's circular field with a 5,600-foot unpaved runway. After the war, the airport returned to civilian use and by 1949 had four paved runways, hangars, and terminal buildings. The airport closed in 1967, shortly after Walker Air Force Base closed and civil operations were moved there. Moving down to the south end of town now, this is Roswell Air Center, formerly Walker Air Force Base and Roswell Army Airfield. It was built in 1941 after the Army purchased the land from a local rancher to build a flight training and bombardier school. Hundreds of single and twin engine trainers packed the tarmac of the seven runway airfield. Nine auxiliary airfields were constructed or taken over in the area for overflow, navigation, and touch and go training. The Roswell Army Flying School was activated in September, just two and a half months before Pearl Harbor. In 1945, the base became specialized in B-29 training. Roswell Army Airfield was also the location of a POW camp for 4,800 German and Italian soldiers, mostly from the North African campaign. The prisoners were used in local construction projects and built many of Roswell's modern parks. This use of prison labor was common across the country. For example, the German POWs at Bradley Field in Connecticut were lent out to local tobacco farmers to work in the fields or to make repairs around farms. Following the war, Roswell Field became the biggest base of the newly created Strategic Air Command. The 509th Bomb Group transferred there in 1946 and had the only personnel trained and experienced in dropping nuclear weapons, having been the unit that dropped the two wartime bombs. The 509th redeployed to the Pacific in the summer of 46 to drop test weapons for Operation Crossroads, the U.S.'s first Pacific testing of nuclear devices. In 1947, debris was brought to Roswell Field from a crash site 65 miles northwest near Corona, New Mexico. This debris was reported to be from a flying saucer, earning Roswell, New Mexico a mythical association with UFOs and aliens that is now central to the economy of the city. The debris actually only stayed on the base for one day before being transferred to Texas for further examination. With the creation of the Air Force as its own service in 1947, Roswell Field was renamed Walker Air Force Base after General Kenneth Walker, a native of New Mexico who was killed during a bombing mission over Rabal during the war. The base hosted F-51 Mustangs and F-84 Thunder Jets on bomber escort duty, B-29s and B-50s, KB-29 and KC-97 aerial tankers, B-36 Peacemakers, and as the jet age arrived, B-47 Stratajets, KC-135 tankers, and finally B-52 Stratofortresses. In 1960, 12 underground Atlas missile silos were constructed around Roswell, further deepening the city's association with nuclear warfare. Walker Air Force Base remained in operation until 1967, when the cost of the Vietnam War forced the Defense Department to make closures and consolidations of stateside bases. 
The units were transferred to other bases, and the airfield was turned over for civilian use. Today, the airport is used for general and commercial traffic and is the storage site for many commercial airliners from American Airlines, Air Canada, Copa Airlines, Kenya Airways, and Scoot. Boeing has used the field for braking tests of its aircraft, uh, most recently on the 737-900, the 787, and the 777. Elvis Presley's private jet was parked at Roswell for 40 years until being purchased in 2023 by the YouTube channel Jimmy's World. Below us is Route 285, and coming into town, somewhere near those orchards there, right on the side of the road, is one of the Roswell welcome signs. Not shown in the game, unfortunately. It is one of three welcome signs commissioned by the city, and represents an about-face in long-standing city policy. Since the 1980s, the city's stance was to not acknowledge the flying saucer crash that has boosted the city's tourism for decades. In 2017, though, to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the event, Roswell decided to finally lean into its fame and hired a company to design three saucer-themed welcome signs for the city's main entry points. One depicts a hovering saucer, one a crashed saucer, and one in the act of sucking cows on board. Each uses solar power to illuminate colorful lights in the saucers at night. Now we're done with Roswell, so let's move on to the next point of interest, the crash site itself, 65 miles northwest in a field near Corona, New Mexico. And let's get into the details of the event, because it has taken on a mythical status, despite being, I would argue, one of the most easily debunked UFO stories out there. It persists, despite the mountain of evidence against it. People simply want to believe. It's the granddaddy of them all, the OG, the event that sparked so much public fascination that it's now part of our pop culture. So what really happened? The story begins on Monday, July 7th, 1947, when a rancher named W.W. W. Brazel, known as Mac, arrives at the Roswell Sheriff's Department with a collection of broken tin foil, rubber, tape, and thin wooden beams. Mac had discovered acres of debris across his ranch weeks earlier on June 14th, but had thought nothing of it and cleaned it up, disposing of it by dumping it under some brush. With no phone or radio on the ranch, Mac was unaware of the flying disc craze taking the country by storm at this time. When he drove into Corona on the 5th of July and mentioned the debris while getting a drink, patrons of the bar he was at were convinced he had a crashed flying saucer. On Monday the 7th, he made the 65-mile trek to inform the authorities. The sheriff contacted Roswell Airfield and they sent out two intelligence officers and a master sergeant to evaluate the debris on Mac's ranch. They loaded everything into a Jeep and drove it back to Roswell. That evening, the debris was flown to Fort Worth and the Roswell Airfield Public Information Office issued a somewhat strange statement to the press that the military had indeed recovered a flying saucer. The local radio station broke the news and forwarded it to the Associated Press which launched a national firestorm of interest. The radio station director was flooded with phone calls from all over the world, as was the sheriff's office. The debris reached Fort Worth, headquarters of the 8th Air Force, where Brigadier General Roger Ramey personally inspected it with his staff and his weather officer. The subsequent press release on July 9 identified the wreckage as a weather balloon, with the entire case labeled a misunderstanding. Many people now believe that the original report was correct, that an alien craft was recovered, and that the follow-up explanation is an obvious cover-up by the military. And, in fact, the second part is right. It was absolutely a cover-up. The military was trying to hide a program called Project Mogul, operating out of Alamogordo, New Mexico, and the White Sands Missile Range, at that time called the New Mexico Joint Guided Missile Range. Project Mogul was classified top secret, priority level 1A, 
and was an attempt to hear evidence of Soviet nuclear tests from the high atmosphere. Dr. Maurice Ewing had proposed the idea after studying how sound traveled long distances in the ocean during World War II. He theorized that similar sound channels could be found in the air, opening an avenue of spying on Soviet nuclear weapon and missile progress from afar. The crashed vehicle really was a balloon. Specifically, it was Mogul Flight No. 4, launched on June 4, 1947 from Alamogordo Army Airfield, now called Holloman Air Force Base. All right, if you thought that the Goddard House was hard to spot before, this site can be nearly impossible. It's very, very hard. There's no reference points out here, very few reference points. I'm looking for a specific intersection of dirt roads, and that's sort of my only main uh, road sign. That and there is a an abandoned airfield made by the oil company just southwest of the site. There are many sites in the area that claim to be the UFO crash site, including some in Roswell itself. So it's been a little hard to track down uh, where the actual crash site is, but from all of my research, this one seems to be the most likely candidate as being the, the proper area. Mac the rancher worked on a place called Foster Ranch, which I believe this is, although if you look up Foster Ranch on Google Maps, it's randomly an area way to, way to the southwest. Um, but that may be a different Foster Ranch. This one, this area seems to be the correct coordinates, but it's going to be coming up ahead here, and there actually is a plaque and a stone obelisk marking the site, which was apparently installed by the Sci-Fi Channel at some point in the early 2000s, uh, commemorating the event and some research that they did for a show there. So if we look, when we get up to it, it's going to be along this dirt road, and it's going to be just to the right of where the road splits into that double and then comes back together. So you see there's the two there, and then just to the east of that, near where the road does a little S, up there is where that monument is. So this is the area, uh, I guess spreading out to our left, this would have been where acres of small flimsy debris was just scattered all over. The 26 balloons um, of the Mogul experiment just dragging uh, uh, you know, all the bits across the scrub brush down here. The game shows a lot of trees, and uh, from what I've seen of pictures, it's far more flat and barren than that. Not really a tree area as depicted here, but you still sort of get the sense of of the countryside. Okay, there's the little spider web intersection just to the right. So that means ahead of us is the road heading northwest. And just off to the left of the nose here, under the nose here, is the Roswell UFO crash site. over the main road here, north-south road. We will circle around just ahead of us. This is the uh, abandoned utility airfield for the gas pumping station, which is right there on the other side of the road. This was built in the 60s when they built this pipeline, natural gas pipeline, stretching from Texas to uh, Los Angeles area of California. But that's one of our points we can use to orient ourselves. Then again, coming back north, I look for that spider intersection, and then we can follow the northwest road up past that. So this is it. So now on our left, this dirt road. So that that fateful day in June of 47, remember that was two to three weeks before he reported it. Mac the rancher was just working out here maybe driving down that very road and just saw debris scattered everywhere. Thought nothing of it, 
and <laughs> gathered it up and hid it under a bush. But you can see there is just nothing, nothing out here for miles. Corona, New Mexico is sort of up to our left. It's up to the northwest, but that's still many miles away. It was uh, not, not a quick trip to get to Corona. But that's the closest civilization. There are various stockade pens, cow, cow pens, uh, in certain areas. We can't quite see them here in the game, but even those are few and far between. So now we're back over the road. You can see that curving road coming from the main one. It's down below. There's the split in the road, so right there. Now the ranch was bought uh, by a by a different family uh, several decades after the Roswell incident, and it's so it's been private land the whole time. Just recently, they have finally opened it up to visitors to be able to actually come see the site itself. And they uh, it's not self-guided, but they organize bus tours from Roswell. Uh, on specified days and you can apparently sign up for the tour, catch the bus from Roswell, which is again probably more than an hour and a half away via road. It's about 65 or 70 miles. 65 as the crow flies. So you would take the bus out here and then they drive you around the ranch and you get to see some of the different sites and then you go back. So that's a recent just in the last few years, a recent uh, development after being closed for many, many years, which is maybe why so many false places went up uh, claiming to be the UFO crash site because the real site was not even accessible. And they were probably, the family that bought the land was probably happy to not have random trespassers just traipsing across their ranch. A typical mogul flight consisted of 23 neoprene balloons designed for high altitude constant level flight, three to five geometric radar reflectors for tracking the balloon, a naval sonoboy, and an electronics black box containing transmitters and pressure switches. They were constructed by members of the New York University College of Engineering who were flown to New Mexico three times to conduct the experiments. The language related to the UFO crash in Roswell often describes the debris as metallic, silvery, or as metal scraps. These terms are misleading, either intentionally or unintentionally, depending on the source. When we hear descriptions in these terms, popular culture and our own imagination usually makes us think of large chunks of metal debris. In fact, it was describing tinfoil and balsa wood not exactly interstellar construction materials. Pictures and original witness accounts by Mac the Rancher and the Army intelligence personnel match the construction of a mogul balloon. A flight engineer who helped load the debris onto the plane to Fort Worth described it as lightweight and small enough to fit into the trunk of a car, hardly the amount of mass that an actual spacecraft would have. UFO theories often describe a giant thermos mug recovered from the crash that then mysteriously disappeared after the debris arrived at Fort Worth. This was the ANCRT-1 Sonoboy. While itself not classified, the Sonoboy would have given away the military nature of the experiments and compromised Project Mogul, which was why it was spirited away. The rest of the material, while creating a large debris field, had not been scattered by a high-speed impact, rather by a very slow tearing as the balloons slowly dragged the fragile radar reflectors across the ground and brush. Max Ranch was not even an unusual landing spot for the Mogul balloons. Several of the earlier flights had come down in the same area and the NYU group had come out to retrieve them. Another famous facet of the Roswell story is the descriptions of hieroglyphics on some of the debris pieces thought by original witnesses to be some kind of language. The original crude sketches of these purple and pink shapes was later, quote, cleaned up by various reproductions in the 1980s, which 
through a game of visual telephone, have carried forward to turn into alien writing on a metal I-beam. The piece in question was actually one side of the radar targets, also called corner reflectors. They were quite large, about half the size of a grown man, and they were made of balsa wood struts and reflective parchment. The Mogul reflectors had been made during World War II by Merrick Manufacturing of Manhattan, a local toy manufacturer who reinforced the edges of the reflector with tape they already had in stock. Tape that was covered in fanciful geometric designs and pink and purple flowers. The toy tape was actually a well-known joke to the NYU team and members of Project Mogul, who thought it was funny that a top-secret military program had to use equipment with pink flowers and hearts on it. The supposed hieroglyphics actually helped confirm to the team that the debris was indeed their balloon. Finally, it needs to be noted that at the time of the Roswell incident, almost nobody thought it had anything to do with aliens. At that time in 1947, flying disks or saucers were not synonymous with spaceship. They were primarily thought to be of Soviet origin and may have been influenced by the recent memory of Japanese Fugo balloon bombs released off the west coast during the war and floating as far east as Chicago and Detroit. In the summer of 1947, the term Cold War had only just been coined that April. Tensions with the Soviets were high and nuclear weapons were on everyone's minds. Americans had only two years earlier seen their own government produce a secret bomb of unimaginable power. And all of this made them primed to believe that the Soviets could produce some equally mind-boggling technology. Only a small fringe element suggested that the flying saucers were extraterrestrial. And as UFO frenzy died down after July 10th, those voices were ignored. In fact, more people believed the religious explanation that UFOs heralded the end of the world than believed they were alien visitors. Roswell itself was forgotten for the next 30 years. It only became associated with aliens in 1978 when a ufologist interviewed Jesse Marcel, the original intelligence officer in the Roswell investigation. Marcel now reported that the weather balloon was a cover story for extraterrestrial debris. In a complicated chain of events that capitalized on public interest in science fiction and an increased societal distrust of the government, various hoaxes from the 50s and 60s were incorporated into the Roswell story to become the modern myth we know today, which includes alien bodies recovered and materials of super strength that could not have been a weather balloon. The proximity to nuclear weapons at Roswell Army Airfield and the Atlas missile sites have also made it easy to retroactively explain that aliens crashed in the area while evaluating our doomsday weapons. Revisionist history has now changed the Roswell story into something larger than life actually making it easier to believe when all of the supposed facts make the episode unexplainable. The truth is simple, however. The unexplainable facts are not facts at all. They were mostly added in the 80s and 90s by several authors, hoaxers, and popular movies. Just on the other side of this mountain range is the Trinity Monument the site of the world's first atomic detonation in 1945. The culmination of the top secret Manhattan project, the bomb was detonated at the Trinity site on July 16, 1945, at 5.29 and 45 seconds AM. The project had begun six years earlier when Albert Einstein wrote his famous letter to President Roosevelt urging the US to research an atomic bomb before Nazi Germany did. Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer established a research facility at Los Alamos, New Mexico, 150 miles north of the Trinity site. By 1944, it was clear that a bomb would have to be tested, and eight different sites were examined. An 18 by 24 mile section of the Alamogordo bombing range was selected and given the code name Trinity by Oppenheimer. The bomb itself was a plutonium implosion device like that of Fat Man dropped on Nagasaki, and used a series of high explosive lenses to uniformly compress the plutonium core into a supercritical mass in a few millionths of a second, 
causing the nuclear detonation. While theoretically sound, the scientists were unsure if the system would work in practice. The bomb might fizzle and be a dud with no results. If the high explosive went off but failed to compress the core properly, radioactive plutonium would be scattered all over the test site. There were also some more general concerns that a nuclear detonation would ignite the entire world's atmosphere or destroy gravity. It was calculated that an airburst would produce the most damage, rather than impacting the ground. So the bomb was detonated on top of a 100-foot metal tower, simulating the effects of being dropped from an aircraft. The shot was supposed to be scheduled for much earlier in the morning, but it was delayed because of heavy thunderstorms that morning. And there was actually someone who had to go up into the metal tower in the middle of the thunderstorm and actually sit with the bomb in the pitch black of four in the morning. A technician had to be up there to wait it out. Imagine being that guy, just lightning striking all around. You're in a metal tower and you're just sitting next to an atomic bomb. Two miles southeast of Ground Zero, right where that 90 degree corner is in the road, is the George McDonald Ranch House. This was the final assembly location for the plutonium core before the bomb was driven out to the tower. The one-story adobe building was built in 1913 by Franz Schmidt, a German immigrant. The McDonald family bought the ranch in the 1930s. The McDonald's would then be vacated under protest in 1942, when the army took over the land for the Alamogordo bombing range. They were given $60,000 in compensation. The house was empty until the Manhattan Project moved in and designated it as the assembly site. Two miles from the detonation, the home's windows were blown out, but the structure didn't take any other significant damage. The McDonald's were expecting the land to be returned to them following the war, but the army announced that this would not be the case. In 1966, the Trinity site was declared a National Historic Landmark, along with the ranch house. In 1982, 81-year-old Dave McDonald and his 32-year-old niece staged an armed occupation of the house for three days, holding up in the dilapidated structure with guns demanding the return of his ranch. The standoff ended without incident when another rancher convinced him to be escorted off the property. Following the incident, the commander of the White Sands Missile Range was able to procure funds from the Department of Energy to restore the house to its 1945 condition. Today, the entire Trinity site, along with the McDonald House, is open to visitors twice a year. I know that doesn't seem like much, but remember this entire area is still an active army installation and weapons testing ground. They do an open house every spring and fall, and actually, if you visit the website, they are warning that they expect the Oppenheimer movie to bring in even more visitors this year and encourage people to get there as early as possible. Now, part of the story of Trinity is before they exploded the real bomb, the scientists needed to calibrate all of their sensing equipment and just demonstrate uh, a fraction of how large a potential bomb might be. And so they detonated 100 tons of TNT. And that took place just a few hundred yards southeast of the actual Ground Zero site. And it was right here in this riverbed. They built a large wooden framework and stacked 100 tons of TNT into it, and this is where they detonated it. Right about where that black circle is, you can see a very old service road heading away from Ground Zero. And so that was the location of the 100 tons of TNT, right, right in that dry riverbed. There was three roads heading away from Ground Zero, and three main observation points were set up at 10,000 yards, so five nautical miles from Ground Zero, and one was on each one of those roads. So we'll take the southern road now, and we'll follow it down, and right here, just past the intersection, right where that little, like, triangle uh, remnants of a road, that was the southern observing station. So again, that's 10,000 yards from the blast site. So five miles, nautical miles. 
And that was right there. And it's strange because when you look at the films of the blast, it seems so far away. But when you're in the air, I mean, look right now, I can see both Ground Zero and the observation uh, site, like all in one camera shot. And so that's kind of crazy. Down to the left here was where their base camp was. This was main base camp. And this was about nine miles, just over nine miles away from the detonation. And so a lot of people were here during the experiment. Um, right there at the, uh, you can sort of see some like remnants of buildings right where that square was. This was where all of the barracks and facilities for the scientists were. And many of them were there during the test. So that was base camp. Back up here at the uh, at the angle in the road, that was the southern observation location. And then we'll head up north and we'll go take a look at the northern observation point and then we'll swing around to the west. We're right there, so we're just over the top of it. That was a small mound of dirt, a bunker essentially built into uh, the desert and contained various sensing equipment and uh, film cameras and several observers. So we're back up over ground zero now and you can see there's the northern, uh, the northern road. Let's turn to follow that. Now you can see that the main road turns right just off the nose there, uh, but in fact there's sort of a smaller, the remains of a smaller almost goat path, an older road, and so we're going to follow that. We're staying on this northern, this northern road here. And there's really nothing to mark the northern observation point other than a small loop in the road is what I'm looking for, and it's right down there. About 11 o'clock, now 10 o'clock low. There it is. There's the loop. This was the location of the northern observation bunker. And again, you can see the point on the ground, and we can see right there where ground zero would be. Uh, you know, all flat, very flat lowlands framed by those mountains in the distance. Even in the game, you sort of get a sense uh, of familiarity with what you see in those films of the experiment. It all looks very familiar to me, despite having never been there in real life. So we're back around looking for that loop. There's the location of the observation post so again by ground you know you can imagine like five miles feels like a long distance from <laughs> from the air here as we're right over the top of the bunker just a few seconds will go by and we'll be back at ground zero now one of the phenomenons of the blast that was recorded by witnesses at the time and was actually featured as a scene in the movie Oppenheimer recently was the extremely long time between seeing the flash and hearing the blast. Enrico Fermi was back at base camp, which remember was nine miles away. He reported that it took 40 seconds for the blast to reach him. As we turn out here, we're going to follow the western road and we'll go look at the western observation point. But after we take a look at that, I want to perform a little experiment. And that is we're going to dive in on ground zero at Mach 1 and I want to maintain the speed of sound out to the observation post to see how long it's going to take to get there. Because I did some calculations and uh, at 10,000 yards at 5 miles, I calculated that the sound would have reached them in 25.83 seconds, so 26 seconds from seeing the flash until hearing it, which sort of sounds like maybe it's too long. 26 seconds is a long time. Think about seeing a flash of lightning and 
within maybe three to six seconds, you hear a boom. So imagine you saw a flash of lightning and then waited almost 30 seconds before you heard anything. Like, it just seems, uh, it seems wrong. But we're going to do the little experiment here, and we're going to see that more than likely, those numbers are actually pretty close to what they would have experienced on that morning. So here is our Western Observation Post, just past the shrimp-shaped parking lot or whatever that thing is off the main road. This is the Western Road heading away. Uh, you can see a, uh, a target circle, a bombing circle down there in the desert. Of course, this area is still completely owned by the U.S. Army and is still used as a gunnery range, so I don't know how old that target might be. Uh, might even still be in use. But yeah, right down to our left here, and right where that little darker road intersects the main road, that is the, once again, that's the observation post. Come down over the top of it one more time and head back to ground zero. I know this was only the first nuclear explosion and relatively small considering the megatons that would come in later decades but the fact that these observation points were only five miles away still seems incredibly close to me but they apparently calculated that 10,000 yards was going to be safe enough and in fact on a later atomic test uh, a bomb was actually detonated at 10,000 feet above the ground with four uh, volunteers well, three volunteers and one cameraman who was uh, was not given a choice. They were actually directly under the explosion, which is absolutely crazy to think about. Uh, they were showing that it was still, quote, safe. I still wouldn't personally wouldn't want to be underneath one because of any, you know, radioactive uh, fallout, detritus that might be falling down through the atmosphere, but... They were all right. They lived through it and lived well after that, so there was no lasting negative effects, apparently. All right, take a look at our fuel gauge. You can see it's it's now down off the 10,000 mark, which means that our wings are empty, so we can stop the fuel pumps and just go back to regular uh, internal center line tanks. So that means that we have, like, actually 9,500 gallons or pounds of fuel left in the plane at this point, which will be plenty for just making the rounds around the missile range and then landing. Up high now, I'm going to bring it around. We've got, uh, got the speed up. We're going to do that Mach 1 run from ground zero to the southern observation point this time. So here we go. We're now diving in on the detonation point. Here come the cans. We're still under Mach 1 a little bit as we come over the top of ground zero. We'll continue accelerating up past the speed of sound. We'll actually go and let it even out. the observation point we made that run in 25 seconds which is lining up pretty much exactly with what I estimated now of course we were not at Mach 1 as we started so let's come back around for a second pass and we'll try to do that a little more evenly we'll stay right at the speed of sound the whole way I could not find the actual temperature at the time of the experiment because temperature can affect speed of sound ever so slightly but looking at modern weather reports at 5 a.m near the site in summertime the temperature is consistently between 65 and 70 degrees fahrenheit so let's assume 70 degrees speed of sound at that temperature is 376 yards per second so for 10,000 yards 26.59 seconds that's where i got that calculation from so let's give it a second try 
We'll count this time and we'll see if we can get a second number that's consistent with the first run and is still close to that estimation. We're coming right down on the deck now. We're just kissing Mach 1. And begin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17. This is the speed of the air blast. This is how long it is now taking. We're up to 23, 24. So there we go. Much more consistent run. 24 seconds that time on the return. So within one second of the first run and within one or two seconds of the estimated time of uh, 26.59 seconds. We're in late afternoon here. Uh, in almost 100 degree weather, so the sound is going to be uh, a little bit different than what it might have been early in the morning at a cooler temperature. But there we go. That was our that was our impression of the of the rolling sound wave from the atomic explosion. And assuming that it ran at Mach 1 and wasn't uh, more supersonic than that, we do see that it took quite a long time for it to reach any of the observation stations. So there we can see again in one shot we can see ground zero and the five mile observation post all at the same time and from this altitude again that distance does not feel all that far away all right that's enough of trinity for now now we're going to head down to the white sands missile range itself we're going to take a look at some other features of the range down to the south because trinity is not the only interesting uh, point of interest on the site White Sands Missile Range is the largest military installation in the U.S. at 3,200 square miles. If you're metrically inclined, that's 8,300 square kilometers. It began life in 1941 when it was established as the Alamogordo Bombing and Gunnery Range. The area had previously been cattle ranch land, and the ranchers were forced out by eminent domain and paid, and the land was condemned by the government. The original Apache inhabitants of the valley had been forced out in the 1870s and 80s, relocated to a reservation in the hills just east of White Sands. The lands had been taken over by white ranchers, so it's ironic that they too would eventually be forced off the same land by the government. The area was taken over by the military despite surrounding in its entirety the White Sands National Park which was established in 1933 to protect the largest dune field in the world of white gypsum salt. The National Park, under the authority of the National Park Service, along with the San Andreas National Wildlife Refuge, also established in 1941, have always had an uneasy relationship with the military. Missiles and ordnance have occasionally fallen into the parks, sometimes damaging visitor areas. Despite having to close occasionally for weapons tests, the park still gets 600,000 visitors per year, making use of the hiking trails, campsites, and picnic areas around the grounds. People even sled on the white sand dunes, and ranger-guided tours are offered throughout the year, both day and night. The northwest corner of the range was selected by the Manhattan Project to detonate the Trinity Bomb in 1945. Just a week before the atomic test, the range was also reorganized into the White Sands Proving Ground, a designated area for researching emerging missile technology. Immediately following the war, 100 German V-2 rockets were shipped to the site, arriving in 300 rail cars of parts. The rockets were assembled, and 67 were test-fired between 1946 and 1951. Guiding these operations were 35 Nazi scientists under the secret Operation Paperclip. Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist, famous for later working with the American space program, was housed at Fort Bliss, Texas, only 35 miles south of White Sands. 
and he participated, under armed escort, in the training of personnel and the firing of the missiles. He would be moved in 1950 to Huntsville, Alabama, to develop intercontinental ballistic missiles. In 1947, the weapons range was again reorganized, gaining more land and becoming the New Mexico Joint Guided Missile Test Range. June of 1947 also saw the first phase of Project Mogul take place at the site. Weather balloons were launched from Alamogordo Army Airfield and explosions were set off on the range to test the listening capability of the balloons. Many of the balloons were taken by the wind and landed outside the range, including flight number four, which would be identified as the Roswell Flying Saucer. In 1960, the range was again renamed and expanded for the last time, becoming the current White Sands Missile Range. And there's the color change. We're coming up over White Sands itself, coming out of the regular desert into this very fine, powdery, bright white sand. It's almost otherworldly. If you look at pictures of the White Sands National Park, it almost looks like you're on some sort of ice planet. It looks the furthest possible from a desert. It looks cold because the white is so bright, uh, so vibrant. But also right here underneath us in the north end of these white flats is Northrop Strip, also known as White Sands Space Harbor. Northrop Field was originally a single dry lake bed runway created in 1948 for recovering damaged drone aircraft. At that time, the White Sands Missile Range was just beginning its surface-to-air or air-to-air -air missile research, and remote-controlled drones were used as targets for many of these missiles. Uh, at that point, probably the QB-17, so sometimes if they were not fully destroyed, they needed a place to come down, and so this runway was sometimes used for recovering those damaged B-17s or other aircraft. In 1976, the site was selected by NASA to be used for space shuttle landing training and as an alternate landing station for the shuttle itself. The first shuttle pilots practiced landings in T-38 Talons and the shuttle training aircraft. The STAs, as they were known, were four NASA-modified Gulfstream II business jets and mimicked space shuttle characteristics on landing. Preparing for the space shuttle program, NASA enlarged the Northrop runway and later added a second and third. Each runway simulates a different landing site around the world, matching length, width, and runway markings. Runway 2305 simulates the Edwards Air Force Base dry lake bed. 1735 simulates Kennedy Space Center. The smallest of the three, 220, simulates Ben Guerrier, Morocco. White Sands was used only once on an actual mission when the shuttle Columbia landed there in March 1982 on the third shuttle mission, STS-3. In 2019, Boeing's Starliner Calypso landed there, making it the second orbital vehicle to land at the site from space. climb back to altitude and we'll continue our course south but just off to our left down in the uh, southeast part of the White Sands is the National Park itself and then further out to our left beyond the edge of the White Sands is uh, Holloman Air Force Base with Alamogordo out beyond that. And that's that's the Air Force Base there. You can just barely maybe see the approach lights on one of the runways, but uh, at this distance in the afternoon sun in the game, it's sort of hard to make out what we're looking at, but that is the Air Force Base there, that green smudge. From here, we just we get a really good view 
of this very peculiar sand pattern as it is moved across the ground by wind, I suppose, maybe even water erosion. Apparently there have been times when the White Sands Space Harbor, the runways have actually flooded out, so there, there must be decent amounts of rainfall every now and then, and maybe that helps uh, contour the ground below us. There's a very unique kind of texture and shape. All right, we're continuing. We're still in the White Sands Missile Range, but we're now continuing down to the southwest. We're gonna follow this road down to the headquarters of White Sands Missile Range itself, and includes all the administration and housing areas for the base. It's also the location of the White Sands Missile Range Museum, which is open to the public, although it's technically within the base, the confines of the base. So uh, there's actually a gate nearby but I guess you have to, you can park at the gate and then walk into the museum as a regular member of the public. Uh, even as a foreign national, apparently, you don't have to be an American. You can be a visitor from outside the country and still, uh, you have to check in at the gate and I guess fill out some paperwork, but then you're allowed to walk in uh, the few hundred yards to the museum and be able to check it out. The White Sands Missile Range Museum was founded in 1994 to preserve artifacts and aircraft used on the range throughout the Cold War and the space race. That's it, that's the town. So interestingly, when I was in sixth grade, my geography teacher uh, was stationed he had been stationed when he was in the army here at White Sands Missile Range. I'd always found that fascinating that he had been here. Even at that time, I knew a little bit about the importance of the site. And uh, he had been here in the 60s, I think, 60s and 70s. So right to the left here is the, uh, is the entrance. You can actually see the gate there. That's the front gate. And then right next to it is the museum. And it's a large main building and then it's got a yard out front which contains all manner of ballistic and test missiles along with drones um there's a there's a qf4 remote drone out there and um there, there's a couple other aircraft so many planes like ours like this f4 that we're in in their post-service career they were shipped off here to white sands and converted to remote control drones to test, you know, anti-air or surface-to-air missiles. Here it comes again on our right. You can see the yard. You can actually just see. Can you spot the outline of the F-4? I can see it. It's Air Force F-4s. A few apparently are left, but as far as I know, they've completely retired the QF-4 and are now using F-16 Falcons as the new shoot-down drones. So they've now progressed into the newer generation of, uh, of modern fighters and are now shooting down F-16s. We follow this road out. This is the uh, road heading east directly out of White Sands. We come up to this circle here. There's sort of a large infrastructure here, and then you can see the road jogs to the right. This is the White Sands V2 launching site. Today, it's called Launch Complex 33, but it was originally the very first launching site on the range and was known as Army Launch Area Number 1. A 75-foot-tall steel gantry stands there used for launching the V-2s as well as later rockets, and a pyramid-shaped concrete observation tower has special windows and a 27-foot thick roof that allowed for close-up observation of launches. All 67 V-2s were launched from this site. In 1982, 
Major General Niles Fulweiler took command of White Sands and took a particular interest in the history of the range. He directed the restoration of the V-2 launch site, which was designated a historic landmark in 1985. Fulweiler also secured funds to restore the McDonald Ranch House at the Trinity site. Both sites were likely saved from destruction by Fulweiler. Continuing east following the road out of the V-2 launch site is Launch Complex 35, a Navy launch site known as USS Desert Ship, LLS-1. This site was built in 1953 to test fire Rimate Talos surface-to-air missiles. The interior of the main concrete blockhouse simulates shipboard launching conditions. The building had a mock christening upon completion, and the LLS stands for Landlocked Ship. It is one of two landlocked ships, the other being USS Rancocas in New Jersey. Special permission had to be granted from Congress to give it a ship name and designation. The site has been used to test modern naval anti-air missiles, including the RIM-66, Aegis Weapon System, and the Standard Missile 6. Next, down the road from Desert Ship is Launch Complex 36. This site participated in the Apollo program from 1964 to 1966, launching the Little Joe 2 rocket in a series of five tests. These rockets are not to be confused with the Little Joes of the earlier Mercury program, which carried monkeys while testing the Mercury orbital capsules. The Apollo Joes carried unmanned command capsules and were used to test the launch escape system. The escape system was a small, needle-shaped rocket on top of the command module that could fire in an emergency and separate the module from the rocket body. Even from the ground on the launch pad, the LAS had enough power to lift the module clear with enough height to deploy parachutes. The Little Joes were the same diameter as a full-sized Saturn rocket, but at only a quarter of the height, giving the rocket a fat, stubby appearance. Launch Complex 36 is still in use today as well, used by NASA firing sounding rockets into the high atmosphere for various meteorological and research purposes. That's gonna wrap up our tour of the southern area of the White Sands Missile Range. As you have seen, primarily where most of the launch pads are located, at least up to 36, probably even more, many of which are still active today and many have historic backgrounds going all the way back to the end of World War II and the formation of the missile range itself as a missile range, not just a bombing range. Uh, we'll head back up north now to the town of Alamogordo and uh, Holloman Air Force Base to make our final approach and landing.
coming in right over the top here of the Alamogordo White Sands Regional Airport, which first opened in 1959. Commercial air service to Alamogordo was originally operated through Holloman Air Force Base behind us until the municipal airport was built. Alamogordo itself is just beyond the airport. A city of about 30,000 people, Alamogordo began in 1889 as a railroad town along the El Paso and Northeastern Railroad. Later, tourism became its primary focus due to the nearby White Sands National Park. After the Trinity test, the city also became associated with the first atomic bomb. In the 50s and 60s, the city was a center of research for pilot safety during the space race. The New Mexico Museum of Space History is there, which focuses on the role the state had in the early U.S. space program. Special attention is paid to the early primates that were sent into space, and includes the grave site of Ham on the premises, the first chimpanzee into space in 1961. Finally, we are approaching Holloman Air Force Base. This base, which we've been talking about the entire flight now in one form or another, uh, began life as the Alamogordo Army Airfield and was used to train bomber crews on the adjacent bombing range. Interestingly, the base was originally intended to be used by the British Overseas Training Program, either to train British pilots away from the dangers of constant attack in their own country, or to train then still neutral Americans who were joining the Royal Canadian Air Force in order to get into the war and help Britain. Entry of the US into the war saw the base used instead to train US bomber forces for deployment to Europe. After the war, the base was renamed for Colonel George V. Holloman a pioneer in guided missile research. The base was used to launch remote-controlled drone aircraft as missile test targets, which it continues to do today. Drones over the years have included B-17s, F-100s, F-106s, and F-4s. The 82nd Aerial Targets Squadron, who have recently retired the QF-4 in favor of drone F-16s, is based out of Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, but has a detachment at Holloman. From 1993 to 2008, the airbase became the home of the F-117 when all the planes were moved from the Tenapa test range at the Nevada test site. The base was also the site of the German Luftwaffe's primary pilot training center in the U.S. Starting in 1996, 300 German military members operating 12 tornadoes began duty rotations in New Mexico. Rotations lasted anywhere from three weeks to six months, training air crews in advanced combat tactics. This program ended in 2019. All right, we got everyone's attention with that first pass, but now here we are. We're going to make our final break to landing. So we're coming down. Normal Navy procedure would be 800 feet above the field, level break, 
pull four G's. We're going to be a little bit lower for more of an air show break, I think, here. around base to final now. Holding just under 150 knots until we get situated. Holding that angle of attack right on target. Bit of power as we're coming down, level out the descent so we're not too hard, but here we go. Good Navy landing. Most of the parts stayed on the runway. This runway is actually so long that we wouldn't even need the drag chute at this point. I'm just going to let it coast down and then we'll use the brakes down at the far end and pull off. We're going to be parking uh, near the base ops buildings, which is just off the end of this runway to the left. So not far to go. Bring the flaps up. Clear of the runway, we'll do our after landing scan. Flaps are up, anti-skid is off, turn off all of the uh, assisted flight controls, transponder off, pedo heat off, taxi on landing off, we can pop open the lids, flaps are up so we're ready to taxi. We're going to make our way over to the flight ops apron, which is just off to our right there. So I'll take this opportunity to thank you for coming along with me on another one of these guided tours. This one was especially fascinating to me. This is uh, this is all stuff that I did not know about, and so I was very excited to learn and then be able to pass that information on to you. I love learning and, and then sharing that here on the channel. So again, thanks for coming with me. I hope that you enjoyed this one. And uh, come back next time for more historical flights. Who knows where? I don't know. We'll have to see. Tune in to find out. See you then.